Welcome to Algorithm Seminar. Uh, today, we're very happy to have David here. Uh, he's a CRA Computing Innovation Postdoctoral Fellow working with Martin Farage Colton at Rutgers University, and will soon join Lawrence Berkeley National Labs as a 2023 Grace Hopper Postdoctoral Fellow. Uh, he earned his PhD at UMass Amherst working with Andrew McGregor. Uh, please welcome our speaker. Thank you. Uh, everybody remote, can you hear me okay? Am I? I assume people give little emojis. I can hear you well. Great. Okay. All right. So today I'm going to be talking about streaming dynamic connectivity. And so my talk has a tagline called To Infinity and Beyond. And in a minute, I'll explain what that means. And so the work I'm describing in this talk uh, is joint work with Michael Farage Colton of Rutgers, sorry, Martin Farage Colton of Rutgers, Michael Bender of Stony Brook, and a whole slew of graduate and undergraduate students. Okay. So I'd like to begin my talk with a story. And the story starts with a grad student named Evan who approached me a year or so ago and said, Hey, David, I'm interested in algorithms, but I'm really more of an implementation guy. Can you give me an interesting algorithm to implement? And so I've, here's a picture of our conversation, and here I'm responding to him. And you can see here's a picture of me thinking about graph algorithms. Uh, you can tell I'm very muscular, which, and that's what happens when you sit around all day thinking about graph algorithms. So this is an accurate photo of me. And so as a graph algorithms person, I respond to him, it would be fun if you implemented Angua and McGregor's algorithm for the dynamic streaming connected components problem. More about that in a second, but, so in the next part of our story, Evan quite reasonably asks me, why do you want me to implement that algorithm specifically? And so when I respond to him, this is no longer theory David talking, but instead system builder David. So I've, I've, I've now put on my work belt and we have our construction equipment because I don't just think about graph algorithms, I'm also interested in building systems that can process graphs at scale. And so it's in this sense that I answer his question and I say, I expect this algorithm to be useful. It should allow us to analyze massive and changing graphs even when they're larger than what we can fit into RAM. Okay, so before I go forward in the story, I just want to define a couple of the details in it in a little bit more depth. So first, I want to tell you what I mean by the dynamic streaming connected components problem. So in this problem, oh, turnstile should be dynamic, uh, different, different uh, terminology, but it means the same thing. So our goal is to find the connected components of a graph on end nodes that's subject to a stream of edge insertions and deletions. So I've got a little toy example down here at the bottom of the graph. We can see that initially our graph has five nodes and no edges. So an input stream tells us about edges in this graph. So maybe it will tell us first to insert an edge between nodes two and five. So we add that to our toy example. And of course, this changes the connected components of the graph. Uh, this is obvious. I'll go quickly through this toy example. Next, we have an edge inserted between nodes two and three. So we add that as well. And then finally, perhaps our input stream also deletes edges. So in this case, it could delete the edge between two and five that we had seen previously. And so our task is to, at any point, be able to answer this question, what are the connected components of the graph defined by the stream so far? And the constraint that makes this problem challenging and interesting is that we only have n times poly log n space available to compute this answer. So of course, there are many, for general graphs, this is not enough space to store the graph explicitly. So we need somehow to make sure that we keep the information we need and throw out everything we don't. So that's the challenge. Next, I want to briefly give you a summary of Angua and McGregor's algorithm for this problem. So this algorithm manages to compress the information in the graph stream using techniques from linear sketching. The result is an algorithm that only requires n times log cubed n space to, get, to give us the answer. So I've got a little cartoon over here where we can see we've got our graph and then it's being compressed down by our algorithm, our sketch algorithm. So we've got a sketch artist here who's giving us the algorithm. And we notice that the sketch representation doesn't look like a graph. It's some other strange representation, but we are able to reconstruct from it a spanning forest of the original graph. And so the impressive thing about this algorithm is that it manages to perform this compression, even though it's been given the stream in an online order. And there are assertions and deletions, and it allows us to recover the connected components with high probability. So this with high probability indicates to us that this is a randomized algorithm, which will be important later. All right, so that's my very brief summary of this algorithm. And so finally, I want to tell you why I expected that this algorithm would be useful. So the promise of this semi-streaming connectivity algorithm is just that it should be able to handle massive graphs. Because the space complexity is so small, the hope is that this should allow us to process larger graphs. So when we look at existing systems that work on graph streams, such as Aspen and Terrace, these systems make the decision to store the graph losslessly. And that's great for lots of applications, but for our purposes, we want to compress further than that. 
And then finally, this opens up a whole world of possibilities if we can get it to work, because we should be able to solve many other problems using similar methods. This connected components sketch is a black box for many other algorithms in the semi-streaming setting. So Evan and I and some other grad students excitedly got together and began to uh, plan our implementation of this algorithm. But very quickly, we realized there would be a problem, which is that the data structure actually seemed like it would be really large once we thought about the constants. A simple back of the napkin calculation for a graph on a billion nodes tells us that this n times log cubed n factor, even before considering constants, was going to require something on the order of roughly 25 terabytes of space. So this is kind of far off from our hope of a small space algorithm to solve this problem. And there are plenty of current applications that care gra about graphs on a billion nodes. So this seems like it's a problem that we need to address somehow. Evan, at this point in the story, quite reasonably asks, perhaps somehow we can reduce the asymptotic space cost of this algorithm. Makes sense. But we quickly realized that there is a lower bound that appeared in SOTA a couple of years ago due to Jelani Nelson and Hua Cheng Yu, which actually shows that the current space, that the space upper bound is tight. There's a corresponding lower bound. And so there's no hope of reducing the space cost of this algorithm asymptotically. Is it in bits or bytes? Bits. Bits, bits. okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, and so this lower bound was hanging over our heads like a dark cloud, and everything seemed pretty hopeless at this point. As we, as we were thinking about it, it might as well have been a requirement for infinity RAM. And so the question was, how could we get beyond this lower bound? So that's where the tagline of the talk comes in, to infinity and beyond. And so I'm going to pause this story at this, at this dark moment for a second, just to give you a spoiler in case anybody's worried. The story has a happy ending. And so we can see here that the rain has stopped and the sun's peeking through the clouds. And so I'm, I want to tell you how we built a system that solves the dynamic streaming connected components problem for a critical use case. And to do this, we had to design an algorithm which works well despite the space lower bound that I mentioned. So we find some way around it. And so using the story as a case study, I'm going to explain what is required for a graph sketching algorithm to be useful. I'm going to highlight some connections and open problems in some other settings. And actually, today I'm going to talk about some follow-up work instead of focusing on these other things. So what do I mean by making an algorithm useful? That's a keyword I mentioned here. Well, there are three things that I claim are required to make an algorithm useful for the purposes of this talk today. The first is that we should be able to run the algorithm on today's hardware. So my first question is this, this challenge of space that I mentioned. How do we overcome this lower bound? Because it seems like these data structures are going to be larger than what we can fit in RAM on a single machine, which is what they were designed for. And so if you can't fit it on your machine, you can't run your algorithm. So that's the first thing we need to overcome, space. The second is, this is a streaming algorithm. We might assume in the real world that our graph is changing perhaps quite quickly over time. So there's a high speed stream of changes to the graph that we need to keep track of. And so the question is, how can we make sure that our algorithm is fast enough to keep up with that stream? So that's our second concern, is speed. And then finally, if an algorithm is going to be useful, it should be meeting a need, preferably a need that nobody else meets with any existing approach. So the question here is, when we look at the existing systems, when are they unable to compute connected components? <clears throat> and so the key word here is density. So these three words, space, speed, and density, are the three things we need to address to make our algorithm useful. And that's what we'll be focusing on for this talk. And so I'll say a little bit more about each of these as we go along, but that's going to be the organization of the talk, is addressing these three concerns. I'd like to start by focusing on this third one, density. So you may remember I mentioned a minute ago that our connectivity algorithm uses n times log cubed n space. And notice how this scales with n, which is the number of nodes in our graph, but it does not scale with the number of edges in our graph. And so that means that this offers us the greatest gains in terms of space when the number of edges is high. In other words, when the graph is dense. So some of you may have heard this commonly held piece of wisdom in the computer science world. So here I have, I don't know if this is Plato or Aristotle or one of those guys uh, saying, uh, large dense graphs don't exist in practice. And when we look at all real world large graphs, they're sparse. And certainly we have an existence proof in the sense that there are lots of large graphs that are sparse and are very important and we do lots of computation on them. And indeed, when we look at the systems, the top of the line systems that are designed to process graph streams, they focus on and optimize for this case of sparse graphs. The most notable examples of this are Aspen and Terrace. So I would like to raise the question though, as a totalizing statement, is this really true? Are there actually no large dense graphs out there? 
So here's a plot. This is a scatter plot showing data sets from the network repository website. So this is a collection of publicly available graph data sets. Each of these orange dots represents one of these graph data sets. Its position on the x-axis tells us how many nodes the graph has. To the right means more nodes, its log scale. And its position on the y-axis tells us how many edges it has. It's a proportion of all possible edges. Higher up means more edges. So what we can see here when we take a brief glance at this is when we look at the left side and we're looking at graphs that don't have a, that many nodes, we see that they exist at a variety of densities. But as we cast our eyes to the right of this plot and we're looking at graphs that are, have more and more nodes, we see that they're exclusively very sparse. Now, at this point, you may be saying, David, it seems like this exactly goes against the point that you were just claiming. It seems like this just supports the idea that there's that all the large graphs are sparse. And so far, given what I've told you already, that is one possible interpretation, but I'd like to briefly suggest another possibility. Just consider it for a moment with me. I've drawn this black line here, which splits my plot into two regions. Everything to the left of this region would be data sets that we can represent using less than 16 gigabytes of space, which is an amount I just picked semi-arbitrarily is the amount of space it might be convenient for an underpaid grad student to have access to five years ago. Uh, and everything on the right side of the plot would be data sets that would require more than 16 gigabytes of space to represent. So another way to label these two sides of the plot is the left side is convenient and the right side is inconvenient. Now, you know, you can move this line one way or the other. I'm not claiming there's anything magic about 16 gigabytes. This is just to, just to kind of illustrate the idea. And so another way to say what this plot shows us is that we see lots of convenient graphs being shared and not many inconvenient ones. So we could rephrase the question is, do we know of inconvenient graphs that are out there? Where are they if they exist? Or do they just not exist at all? And in fact, we do know that some of these graphs exist. For example, Facebook researchers wrote a VLDB paper in 2015 uh, where they were working with very large and very dense graphs. In some cases, something like 40 million nodes and hundreds of billions of edges. But they only did this at great cost on huge supercomputing clusters. And so the unwritten suggestion here is that they were only doing this for data that was very valuable to them and likely proprietary and not the sort of thing they were uh, they were interested in sharing. And even if they did, other people probably wouldn't have had the resources in 2015 to deal with anyway. And so we know that there's at least a couple graphs in this inconvenient region from this sort of thing. So I think that this points to a selection effect in place. We, in general, lack the tools to process large and dense graph streams. And so they're rarely studied, and people, why would people publish data sets? Why would people even construct these data sets if they either can't work on them at all, or they would require lots and lots of resources to do so? So I would like to raise the question for everyone to think about, what could we do with general purpose graph processing systems, and not just systems optimized for the special case of sparse graphs? And in fact, I'm thrilled to be giving this talk at Google today because I think that this is the sort of place where people might have large scale computing needs. And so in particular, I want to invite people to think about the question. Imagine, not forget about connected components, just imagine that you could do any computation you wanted on graphs that were really large and dense. What opportunities would that open up for you? What applications would that make approachable in a new way? If anybody has any thoughts about this, come find me later or shoot me an email. I'd love to talk about it. But so in particular, I want to highlight here that we're building a we're building a capability that didn't exist before. And so there might be opportunities that are not immediately obvious. You have to get used to the idea that there might be this new capability and think about what we can do with it. I should move on, but that's my bit about density. Happy to talk more about that offline with anyone who's interested. So now I want to say a little bit about our next two concerns here, space and speed. And then I'm also going to go into a little bit more detail about some algorithmic stuff. So when we last left our heroes, me and Evan, we, there's that rain cloud hanging over our heads and things seemed really terrible. And there were the primary reason for that was this space concern. Like I said before, this n times log cubed n space concern actually is really large. And their constants involved also are large. So the expectation is that for any reasonably sized graph, this is probably going to be overflowing RAM. There are other concerns that I didn't mention as well that are also a big concern. So for instance, it turns out that with the existing algorithm, due to Angua and McGregor, processing these graph updates and answering the queries are very, very slow. And what's worse, let's say you wanted to deal with this space problem by allowing your algorithm to spill over RAM and have the extra stored on disk. 
Well, because the algorithm is randomized and it's making random accesses all over the place, doing that out of core is going to be extremely slow. And at least when you look at this at first glance, these randomized algorithms, there's no obvious way to de-randomize them. The randomness is kind of part of the whole point. So it's not clear immediately if there's some, uh, some way to make that work easily. And of course, I told you the spoiler that there's a happy ending to this story. So we do have ways around these issues. And so we came up with a better sketching algorithm, which we call cube sketch. And so in this extremely technical figure on the left here, you can see that our sketching artist now is a cube for a head. Uh, so that's why it's called cube sketches because <laughs> that's not actually why, but you know, so like now this is the cube sketch algorithm and some highlights about what the cube sketch achieves compared to the existing algorithm. It can process updates more than three orders of magnitude faster in practice, and it uses eight times less space. Remember, we can only improve the space by a constant factor due to this uh, asymptotic lower bound. But constant factors still help, especially almost in order of magnitude. These next two points, though, are the really key points that make this algorithm useful. And I'll spend some time in this talk really trying to outline why these things help. The first one here is that this algorithm, this new cube sketch algorithm, you can run it, if it fits in memory, you can run it like a normal streaming algorithm, but you can also run it in the external memory model. And if you analyze it in that model, running the entire algorithm and getting your connected components answer requires order sort E IOs, which matches the best known upper bound for connected components in external memory. More about the, the uh, how that helps us in a minute. And the final point here is that it's still space optimal. So these are the two things that really save us. Uh, oh, actually, I think I'll say a little bit about why before I get into the algorithmic detail. The point is when people were originally thinking about the semi-streaming model, they thought, well, our algorithms are gonna have to live in RAM because that's the only thing fast enough to keep up with a high-speed data stream. But we're seeing a hardware trend where disk is getting faster, faster than RAM is getting faster. So the bandwidth gap between these two devices is shrinking, at least in the case where you're using the disk efficiently, where you're, for instance, writing large, making large sequential writes or reads to disk. In that case, the bandwidth gap between these two things is closing. So if you have algorithms that are efficient or getting close to optimal in external memory, the hope is that these algorithms may be able to compete with RAM algorithms. Uh, but th for that to work, you don't have unbounded disk space, right? Like the disks that are fast like this, there are space limitations. And so it is important that you're still space optimal. Maybe a, a super huge dense graph, you still would not be able to fit in on these fast disks. So it's actually important still that we're saving space using these sketching methods. So that's the theoretical justification. And later I'll show you, later in the talk, I'll show you how I can back this up with uh, implementation. But first I wanna give you a little intuition for how the algorithm works in general and then for why we're able to use it in the external memory model to minimize these data movement costs. So I'd like to start, before I describe to you the sketching algorithm for connected components, I'm going to describe to you an extremely inefficient algorithm, both in terms of time and space for connected components, and then show how to fix it. So we've got a graph here, a toy graph on five nodes, and the dotted lines indicate edges on this graph. And so we're going to encode this graph as a set of vectors. We have one vector for each node in the graph. In each of these rows, non-zero entries represent edges incident to those nodes. So here we have each, so we've got first this row vector here that is in that is for node one in our graph, the second one is for node two, et cetera. And the columns are indexed by all possible edges in the graph. So the first one is one comma two, then one comma three, all the way up to four comma five. Hopefully this is all clear. I'm gonna go kind of quickly through this construction. Interrupt me if you have questions. And so the rule is to populate each row, I only, I only, everything is zero in that row unless it's an incident edge on that node. And if it is, then I add either a one or a negative one in that position. So for node one, it only has one edge incident to it, which is, which is connecting it to two. And so the only non-zero in its row is going to be this one in the first column for edge one comma two. And so we say by convention here that the, that in a column representing an edge, the first time we see a non-zero, it's a one, the second time, the second and last time we see it, it's a negative one. The reason why for that will be clear in a minute, but we just have to keep that constraint. So the reason we do this, okay, so yeah, here's my example right here. So I've got this edge. And so on this column, we have two non-zeros because the edge exists and they're in the, the rows that represent those endpoints. And so if we look at say the row for node number two, it shows us all of the edges that are incident to node two. 
So these things encode the neighborhood of each edge, uh, sorry, of each node in the graph. But they have a nicer property than this, which is this third line I've got written here, which is we can sum together multiple vectors and the resulting sum vector encodes the edge set across the cut defined by those nodes. So if I wanted all of the edges that cross the cut between one and two, I would add together the rows for one and two. So the internal edges, in this case, the edge between one and two, that would cancel out because we have both of the non-zeros there. And these, and only the edges that cross the cut, they would have uh, one non-zero and uh, one zero, so they would remain non-zero in the sum vector. And of course, every edge that doesn't touch any of these nodes at all is just still zeros, right? So this has the nice property of allowing us to represent cuts by a simple summation operation. Okay, so using this, uh, using this data structure, we can do something like Borovka. Again, it's not efficient, but we can do it. So we can grow supernodes in the Borovka style, where we start off where each node is its own little island, and we sample an edge each incident to each of these nodes. So say maybe the node we sample, so the edge we sample for node one is this red edge, and when we sample two, it gives us the same edge that can happen sometimes. And then down here for three, we get this edge, and four gets the same edge, and then five gets this edge over here. And so what we've done after this first round is we've discovered two super nodes in our graph. And so to prepare for our next round, and so we can do that instead of by looking at the picture of the graph, we can do that just by looking at these row vectors. We can just pick a non-zero entry arbitrarily from each of these row vectors to get those, that outgoing edge. And then to prepare for our next round of Borovka, for everything, every node in a new super node that we've discovered, we just sum those vectors together. And then for the next round, we query that summed vector for one of its non-zeros to get our next edge. And this requires log n rounds to do it in total just because of the standard analysis for Borovka. So, so far I've shown you a real, like this is like a N cubed space algorithm. This is not good at all or it's efficient, but we're going to make it efficient. And so the way we do that uh, is by using a linear sketching technique called L0 sketching. The idea of this technique, which I'm going to present for now is a black box. I'm, I can talk technical details if I have extra time at the end or I can talk to people offline, but I just wanna give you the flavor of how this thing works and then why it helps us do some other stuff. So this allows us to compress a vector that's uh, of length n into a summary that is only log squared bits long. So it's so we get an enormous space savings by doing this. We have to obviously throw out a lot of information about the vector. But the property that it has is it allows us to sample a single non-zero entry from that vector x uniformly at random with high probability. And the nice thing is that we can update this over time. So if one of the positions in our vector suddenly flips from a zero to a one, we can update this summary relatively quickly and without increasing the space at all. So the point here is that we can imagine as the edges are being streamed into our graph and they're being inserted and deleted, that's going to be flipping some of these zeros to non-zeros and back. And we can, we, can ins we can process that into our L0 sketch and still have the small space and at every time be maintaining this property that we can sample one of the non-zero entries uniformly at random. And crucially, this is a linear sketching operation. And so because it's a linear operation, that means that we can, so we can make a sketch of each of these row vectors. And if we sum the sketches of two row vectors together, that's the same thing as if we had first summed those row vectors together and then sketched them. So what this means is we can do this Borovka kind of procedure I described earlier on the sketches. So I query a sketch, I get an edge out of it. And then if, if one is going to be connected to two, I merge their sketches together. I just sum them together. And then I can query that resulting sketch and that will guarantee to give me an edge across the cut between one and two on one side and all the other nodes on the other side. So linearity gives us this nice property. We can combine these sketches together in small space to allow us to sample across arbitrary cuts in the graph. And of course, sampling across cuts is the kind of thing that you need to do Borovka and get connected components. And so the, the point I want everyone to take away here is that these L0 sketches are compact and highly local summaries of graph cuts. They're local in the sense that they, they compactly give you a lot of information about the cut and then you can combine them. And so that's important to keep in mind. And this compactness and locality don't just give us the small space. That was established by Angua and McGregor in their initial algorithm. But what we showed in this follow-up work is that you can actually use this data locality properties to get this nice external memory result like I mentioned. 
Yeah. So I have one question for L0 sketching here. Uh, do you keep a, a positive and negative L0 sketch for each node? Or is L0 sketch really just? And L, you can think of an L0 sketch as you have an arbitrary integer vector, and it's just compressing the entire thing down for you. So when you mean by positive and negative, do you mean for like well, positive? Well, and I mean, like the L0 here? norm of one of these plus minus vectors is just a number of not zeros. Yeah. So I was just wondering if you somehow keep a separate positive and negative one when you're doing these sums together, or? Actually, no, you don't need to do that. You can just do it all at cool. once, right? Like, um, and in fact, a different way to think about this, instead of the ones and negative ones, you can just imagine doing this over the field F2. So, you know, you're just doing bit flips sure. and it all still works out the same way. Yeah. Good question. Um, and everybody, again, please interrupt with questions if you have them as well. So the intuition for how this works is that we can build these cut sketches and then sample across them via repeated sorting. We can sort to kind of get all the sketches that we want to combine near each other and then merge them all in a single scan through. And we, this is cheap to do because the sketches are small and because in external memory, sorting stuff is relatively uh, efficient. And so each round of Barufka requires a small number of these kind of sort-like operations over the sketches. And because sorting is efficient and we're sorting something much smaller than an ent entire edge list, we can do this very efficiently. And so I claim, and it's like the theory would predict that this week means we can run the algorithm on disk without having to sacrifice speed. We don't just need to be limited to RAM. Okay, and so uh, that's the high. That's all the algorithmic stuff. I think I have time to say for now about Cube Sketch. If people are interested, and I have some extra time at the end of the talk, I'm happy to go into more detail about how Cube Sketch works and the optimizations we made. But that's that's enough for now. So this isn't all just theory. We went and actually built this system based on this algorithm. We call this system Graph Zeppelin, and this work appeared in Sigmod 2022. Let me explain the name briefly. So the tagline for this system is avoiding the data explosion in graph streams. And so it's named after this famous lighter than air aircraft called Graf Zeppelin with an F, which was, I think, the first lighter than air aircraft to circumnavigate the globe. And it most notably was not the Hindenburg and never exploded. So that's why we call it that. And so it solves this streaming connected components problem using our cube sketch algorithm. Oh, these numbers are out of date. So I apologize for this. But uh, when the version we sent to Sigmod, we were able to update something like 3.5 million updates per second when our data structures weren't RAM. Today, this is probably something more like 12 to 15 million updates with some engineering changes we made. I don't know. I, I'll have to check the exact numbers, but it's faster now. And uh, so it's fast in RAM. And then instead, when you want to run it instead on, uh, on disk, it's still fast. We got something more like more than 2.5 million updates per second when we ran it on a consumer SSD, by which I mean, I went into Best Buy and just bought some like SSD, Samsung SSDs off the shelf. So we weren't using fancy hardware and we were still able to get millions of updates per second. And it's also compact. That's the whole point, right? In one of the experiments we did in this original paper, we were able to compress a stream of more than 200 gigabytes into a sketch that was about 45 gigabytes on a graph with something like two to the 18 nodes. Since then, we've done larger scale experiments. I'll talk more about them later. But so this is just what we did in this first paper. So I just want to give a, a little overview of what we were able to accomplish compared to the state of the art systems once we put these techniques into practice. So the state of the art systems, I mentioned them earlier in the talk, talk, Aspen and Terrace, are specifically optimized for sparse graphs, like most systems are. So we're comparing outside of their niche, but they're the best things to compare against, so that's what we're doing. So we know asymptotically that Graph Zeppelin is going to be significantly smaller than either of these systems on dense graphs, right? We only need log, n times log cube dense space, they need something like n squared space. But the question is, okay, asymptopia might be years and trillions of nodes away from us right now, how close are we are to actually seeing real space savings? Well, the fact is we don't need to go to very large graphs to start seeing these savings. So when we were working with graphs that are fairly dense on just a couple hundred thousand nodes, we can see that we get to a point where Aspen is about twice as large as Graph Zeppelin's data structures and Terrace is about 10 times larger. Uh, so the crossover point, we've already reached it. By the, time, by the time of doing these experiments. So if you're working on suitably dense graphs, you're already saving space compared to the competition. It's also faster. When we consider these data structures, all of them just running in RAM, Graph Zeppelin ends up being twice as fast as Aspen and more than 10 times faster than Terrace. And again, I wanna note that these are on dense graphs specifically. They kick our butts on sparse graphs, that's what they're designed for. 
and we're kind of again moving like testing them outside of their intended use case but they're the best comparison uh is there anything else i want to say about this here i guess not i guess i'll move on then oh uh rather go into the details about this and then the final thing is that when all three of these systems page to disk we can see that graph zeppelin and uh, graph zeppelin uh still has good performance and these other systems don't so this solid line up here is for graph zeppelin and so again we've got increasing number of increasing size of data sets and number of nodes as we go right on this plot and y position on the y-axis tells us how quickly we ingest in millions of edges per second and this is a log scale graph so aspen and graph zeppelin both go to disk at about data structures of this size and so we see when they go to disk that graph zeppelin its performance goes down a little bit maybe by a something maybe like a factor two or three on this log scale graph but still relatively good performance when it goes to disk aspen in contrast very quickly falls to almost nothing which again is not a knock against this system it was not designed to go out of core it was not designed to work on dense graphs and there's a similar story for terrace here so my point here is just simply to show that when you're dealing with dense graphs you very quickly get to a case where the existing systems first aren't so aren't so uh fast even when they stay in core and then as soon as they spill out of core and are forced to page to disk they're no longer useful but graph zeppelin is stays in ram longer and is more useful even once it pages out of disk so that's the niche that we're focusing on and we beat the state of the art in that niche so now i'd like to say just a little bit about some follow-up work we've done since that sigmod publication and so this is work that's currently in submission so the question here is, so Graph Zeppelin's found a niche and it can do some stuff that existing systems can't do. What is required to scale even further than this first system? So let me tell you about the current bottleneck that's causing a problem for this version, the single machine version of Graph Zeppelin that I've been describing to you. It's bottlenecked on CPU. I didn't have time yet to go into the sketching algorithm, but each time you have an update, part of the price you pay for the small space is that you have to do a whole bunch of work. There's a lot of hashing involved. And so this work it requires order log squared work per update. And the constants involved are fairly large. So that's a fair bit of work, especially on a dense graph where you want to process something like hundreds of billions or trillions of edges. This is a lot of total work. And for reasons that have to do with the data locality stuff I mentioned earlier and the linearity of sketches, updating these sketches is extremely parallelizable, but there's still too much work for the number of cores that you have on a processor in a single machine, at least at the scale that we were working at. So the bottleneck for our system is CPU. That's what we would need more of to get Graph Zeppelin to go faster. Before I tell you how we resolve this, I want to briefly survey some other bottlenecks that often cause problems for large scale streaming graph systems. Another bottleneck that other systems run into is space. So I mentioned earlier how lossless representations such as Aspen and Terrace bottleneck on space for the case of dense graphs. And so if you have a dense graph, even if you just have millions of nodes, maybe you don't have enough RAM on a single machine to represent all of that explicitly. You need to use these lossy compression methods if you have any hope of processing these dense graph streams uh, on a single machine. That's just kind of the price of entry. You can't deal with, lo with lossless representations. So that's the bottleneck they run into is a space bottleneck. Finally, there's another solution that one might use if you want to do lossless comp if you want to do lossless computation, but you don't just want to be on a single machine. Perhaps you can you can uh, distribute all the information across your graph uh, of your graph across nodes in a cluster, right? And take a distributed approach. And these systems can spread out the space and CPU costs, but they also they tend to run into a different bottleneck, which is network communication. Graphs famously have poor data locality, and workers have to send lots of information to each other. And so in many cases, this is a bottleneck for these distributed systems. And so to scale better using our sketching approach, we need to find a way to address all three of these bottlenecks at the same time. And so I, I have just time to give you the briefest summary of some work we're doing where we're overcoming these. And I give you a sense of why, and I'm happy to talk technical details offline if anybody's interested. So we can address all these for, for uh, some part of the problem space. We can address all three of these bottlenecks simultaneously. Our approach is we keep our sketch on a made node in our cluster that's receiving the input stream. And then we distribute the computation required to do the updates to worker nodes in a cluster. This addresses the space bottleneck because first we're asymptotically optimal and we make some further algorithmic improvements to the sketch algorithm that save us another constant factor over graph Zeppelin. 
So there is a parameter range for which it makes sense. You've got large graphs and you're able to process them on this single machine. We deal with the CPU uh, bottleneck in the way I just described. We have all these distributed workers that are able to handle the CPU load. And because of the linearity of our sketches, we're able to send out batches of work to these distributed workers. They don't need to really synchronize with each other very much. And the summaries, the, the results of the work that they send back are small. And we also, it, with our improved sketch algorithm, we managed to reduce the total work per update from log squared down to log. So that's a significant uh, reduction in the overall load in the first place. But the key thing, the thing that really makes this possible is that these linear sketches are insanely parallelizable and a distributed cluster finally gives us access to enough processing power to take advantage of that. How did you speed up log squared into log n? Was it like making use of some word round tricks or? Uh, so you don't need to do that. It turns out that there, um, that uh, for the standard L zero sketching, you've kind of, you've got this idea of you've got these, um, you know, you've got these random sets of positions in your vector, and they're kind of like contained within each other. You're doing subsampling, uh, and um, the are you are you familiar with this with what I'm saying already? Or um, I guess so. I'm okay. Okay. So you. so. The cube sketch stuff from last time reduces the complexity of one part of the operation. It removes some uh, it remo removes some modular exponentiation stuff you have to do. And once you've done that, there's an extra like you can update fewer of the random subsamples each time you do an update and still keep the distribution you want. Uh, that's a trick that you could always do, but before when you were doing modular exponentiation, it wouldn't make things faster. But now that Cube Sketch has gotten rid of the modular exponentiation stuff and made some other things faster, we can additionally use this trick to do uh, kind of like pickier random subsampling, and then that reduces that reduces a log factor off. I can I'm not doing a great job of the summary because I'm I'm trying to skip details, but I can show you the whole thing later. Um, but the idea is like this is not possible unless you also do the stuff from Cube Sketch, but it it kind of works out. Um, and then finally, this communication thing is a crucial part as well. So we can prove that to process a stream of length capital N, our system only uses alpha N communication in total, or alpha is some small constant. And note that if we're assuming that you received your input stream over a network link, then N is a trivial lower bound on the amount of communication that your system could ever possibly use, even if it's just running on a single machine. And so we're we're only a small constant factor away from a trivial lower bound for the amount of communication required. And we accomplish this using similar locality tricks that allow us to get good performance on disk with our external memory algorithm. We're taking advantage of the fact that the sketches can give us small space cuts, which are efficient to communicate across the network, and that they can represent arbitrary cuts for us if we do work in the appropriate way. And again, I, that's all the intuition I think I have time to give here, and I'm happy to talk details later. So again, this is not just a theory thing. This is all another thing that we've built. So we're calling this one Zeppelin fleet. So instead of having a single single Zeppelin that's not exploding, we now have a distributed cluster of Zeppelins that are not only not exploding, but you can see they're soaring over all three of our bottlenecks here. And so we were in one of our experiments here, we were able to process a graph with about a million nodes and with something like 137 billion edges at almost 200 million updates per second. And we only needed something like 100 gigabytes of RAM to do this. So this is a getting, you know, this is a one or two orders, uh, maybe like one and a half orders of magnitude improvement so far over what we were able to do on the single machine. And in fact, this is faster than random RAM bandwidth on the main node. So which if which if you one thing we were thinking early on was, well, since graphs have poor data locality, maybe random RAM bandwidth is sort of like a natural bound on how quickly you'd be able to do anything in RAM with the graph, because you're doing random accesses all over the place for dealing with your graph. So that's your that's your bottleneck. But in fact, because of these data movement things that these data movement techniques that we came up with that take advantage of sketch locality, we actually go faster than that. And we're within a factor four of sequential RAM bandwidth. So again, if you're receiving the input stream at a main node, you have to log it down in RAM before you do anything else. We're getting close to the point where we're bumping up against that as our bottleneck. And actually, we're able to show that experimentally. So here I've got, this is the only plot I'll show for this one. But here our plot on the x-axis is the number of distributed threads. So as we add more workers in our cluster that allow us to do our sketch updates, we go further out to the right. And then the y-axis shows us our ingestion rate in 
uh, in uh, millions of edges per second. And so we can see as we add more threads for a very long time, we get this really nice linear increase, which is the sort of thing we were hoping to see from the linear sketches. And then at some point it starts to level off here. And the question is, well, okay, this could be because we finally exhausted all the parallelism in our algorithm and we're CPU bound again because we have no more parallelism to deal with. But in fact, we were able to experimentally confirm that that wasn't the case. The way we did that was we reran this last data point out here and all we did was we swapped out the RAM in the main node for RAM that had a higher sequential RAM bandwidth. And when we did that, the throughput went up to this red dot here. So we were able to experimentally verify that it actually was sequential RAM bandwidth that was the thing that was slowing us down. So I think this is kind of like this is uh, quite a, a nice experimental result and suggests really drives home the point that it's not just like this sort of thing might work one day for for processing dense graphs. We're actually blowing through a bunch of bottlenecks that we expected to cause us problems, at least in the right parameter regimes. And this is really a useful and scalable method. So uh, I just want to take a minute or two to describe a few directions that I'm excited about for future work. Uh, so in the original semi-streaming model, pure theory, typically when people think about these algorithms, they assume that you have a stream and it is finite length. And during that stream, you're just ingesting the stream. And then at the quote unquote end of the stream, you have to give an answer. So there's no real notion of a query model, except that you do one query at the end. But of course, in real life, there are many interesting streaming cases where there's no end to the stream. It's not just one time that you're going to want to know what's going on. You're going to want to make queries all the time and you want to minimize the latency of those queries. And so one question is, how do we get faster queries for this and other sketching algorithms? And so there's a beautiful result in the theory literature that shows how you can use this connected component sketch. You can use it plus some other techniques to get queries that are blazing fast, log n over log log n time per query. And the cost for this is that your update time increases to log over the to log fourth of n. And it's in fact, nobody knows how to get a better worst case update time bound for this problem than this, even if you aren't limit constrained on space. And so this would be a nice thing to, to work on in practice, except that there are some reasons why this algorithm doesn't seem practical as is. It's not obvious how to parallelize or distribute this algorithm. And one of the things I've just shown you today is that these graph sketching algorithms bottleneck on CPU. So you really need parallelism or else it's never gonna work. So it's not currently known how to do that. It's also slow in external memory and isn't as easily uh, translatable to external memory than the relatively straightforward algorithm that's slower on queries that I've been describing to you today. So those are some practically minded open theoretical questions that if we can solve, would drastically improve query performance for these systems. There's also open questions there about, just as a pure theory question, whether you can reduce the worst case update time from log to the fourth to something more like log to the third, which is an interesting thing that I would love to chat about if people are interested. And then, of course, there are lots of other directions I don't have time to describe, but another natural one is, can we take more of these sketching algorithms to infinity and beyond? So I've taken you all the way from an initial beautiful theory algorithm that seemed hopeless to something very practical for connecting components. But there are lots of other algorithms in this literature that we're excited to start mining for ideas next. The, in particular, I want to call out correlation clustering in this list of nice sketching algorithms that I, I think there's a practical need for and that, the, that we can see a path forward from the existing algorithms towards something that would be practical. So that's something I'd be happy to chat about, but uh, anything else is interesting as well. And outside, if you don't see your problem listed here, but you think you have a large scale graph problem and it would be interesting to think about it in terms of dense graphs, even if it's not listed here, I want to hear about it and talk to you about it. So I just have a couple of takeaways, one from each version of David that we saw at the beginning of the talk. The first takeaway is from Theory David, who sits around and thinks about algorithms. And so his take, his moral of the story is that you should be including IO bounds if you're writing semi-streaming graph algorithms. In other words, you should be thinking about data movement costs. Maybe you can do this distributed as well, because the reality is for most useful cases, we're not going to be in core. And so we should be, and as a secondary, as like a part, as like a more general statement than this, we should be optimizing for running times and not just for space. Because a dense, a graph that's suitably dense and is large enough, you're going to be dealing with at minimum hundreds of billions or trillions of edges. If you have a high running, you know, you have a high update cost, it's just never going to be useful. The prize if we do these things is graph algorithms that will be useful right out of the box. And one nice, a consequence of the happy ending of this story is that we don't have to throw out the techniques from the semi-streaming setting. They're part of the solution for practical algorithms, but there's more exciting work to be done algorithmically as well.
And my final takeaway is System Builder David's takeaway, which again is something I've mentioned several times during this talk, and I'm especially interested to hear people's thoughts about, which is we should be embr embracing dense graphs, applications that could benefit from them, or rethinking problems that we were previously thinking about in some different way, but could be useful to think about as a problem on a dense graph. And so my, my question is, not only does your application have dense graph problems, but imagine that we had this capability not for connected components, but for a variety of graph problems. What things that you previously didn't consider as even possible might now be conceivable? And so I believe very strongly that if we do these things together, we'll be able to process much more massive grass than we ever have before. So thank you. Yeah, so I have a question on, oh, Siddhar, like, go first. Uh, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I think I always confuse the clapping and the, the hand raising. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah. So you said that you're you're bottling by CPU. How many? Do you know how many cores would you need to have on your machine to to uh, for CPU to catch up with with RAM bandwidth? So uh, let me think about that for a second. I would. Um, so. We, we are seeing linear improvement as we add more threads into the thousands here, right? So like, uh, I don't know what the maximum is, but uh, it's higher than higher than a couple thousand for whatever mach AWS machines we were running this on. I'm just wondering whether like, you know, but these are the CPUs on different machines, so maybe it would be more efficient. Uh, yeah, yeah, it, it, so, it could be that more powerful CPUs could do better, I'm yeah. not sure. The one thing we're actively looking into is GPU acceleration as well, which this, is like this was supposed to be my second question. Yeah. yeah. So the, we're very early days on that, but it looks promising. Yeah, because it's like looks like it's exactly this kind of application where, um, yeah, you have very uh, fine-grained independent yeah, problems. But yeah. then, what is the current architecture? Is that are you assuming that the updates are coming into multiple machines that only once they sketch the update they come to the central machine, or is the central machines receiving all the updates, distributing the work? And then updating is the second one is what we're okay. thinking about so far, which seems more, you know, like, so we, we picked, we, we imagined, okay, we, we weren't the distributed thing for this work, this preliminary work is like a means to an end. So imagine that you just have a streaming problem and behind the scenes, you have a whole cluster that you can use, but you need to solve in your internal data movement problems. Uh, there's a, you know, like, we have not been pushing as hard on the implementation side on thinking about what happens if your data starts off distributed. So the approach here was a more classical streaming one, but there's, but something like this probably could also be relatively, you know, I think something like this also likely works well in the case where your data starts off distributed. I, I mean, I think what you're doing is like strictly harder setting. So it's, yeah. in that sense, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's cool to see the, the, the good results. I'm, I'm very curious to see, like, do you think the GPU bandwidth may be the bottleneck? What do you do when you do things on GPU? Yes, especially because, I mean, as I've been talking with some of the GPU folks, there's like Intel's doing like Intel makes it hard to talk to your GPUs, right? Like, so they're like the bus there is often a limiting factor. And so I suspect that that will be a problem with GPUs. And I don't know how bad it will be yet or if there's a way around it. I mean, on the other hand, I, I mean, you have the GPU bandwidth versus network bandwidth, right? So sure. Yeah, yeah I'm not I. I don't have enough experience with that hardware yet to see how it all plays out. Another thing I will say, though, if we're talking bandwidths, that might be interesting. There's even more work that's even more speculative that we've just started to do where, OK, so with this architecture I described to you, the input stream is coming in, it's hitting a main node, and we're deciding to keep all of our sketches on that main node. Another thing we could do and another thing we have designed and are starting to prototype and test is uh, the stream is still coming in from one place, but now we're partitioning our sketches across different nodes, which allows us to scale higher, you know, like, so now we don't need, need to be able to score, store the sketches on a single machine. So now if you're, if you don't consider it cheating for our input stream to be routed by a router, doing a simple method to send updates to different, like to the appropriate worker nodes that have their appropriate sketches, we've observed in that case, we're not even bottlenecked by sequential RAM bandwidth. We're now bottlenecked, like, so, we haven't gone high enough to see to actually uh, to the point where we're CPU bound again. Uh, AWS won't give us enough cores. <laughs> we're working on that, but so 
it's not like depending on the architecture you set up here, different things could become the bottleneck and it's not clear what the ultimate one is. It's something we're actively thinking about. And another thing we're trying to nail down is what exactly is the right distributed model when we're doing something like that to design the algorithm in. Because it's, it's sort of like the MPC model, but there's some differences. And so this is one reason why I want to learn more about AMPC. Yeah, I have a question. So, um, for uh, so in in, the, in this kind of like the uh, problem you your studies like you at the end just like have like one query like compute the the kind of components right for for now. Uh, what's the what's the uh, running time in theory and in uh, in your uh, in practice? Right. So for 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 Graf Zeppelin, the non distributed one, uh, that uses the simple the the basic query algorithm from the initial sketching thing, and that takes something like n times log squared or log cubed time because what you're what you have to do even for your first round of barovka is you have to look at each of these sketches and you have to get an edge out of them and then you're doing some recombining and so you have some like logarithmic number of rounds where you're where you're merging these sketches together so you have a couple the first couple rounds you're doing like linear or linear times log amount of work right so like that's kind of, and so if you have to do that from scratch every time you do a query it's painful so in the original graph zeppelin paper we did a bunch of software engineering but no algorithmic redesign we did some like uh some like multi-core stuff to make the query somewhat faster I see. and i think we got to the point where we were dealing with graphs close to a million nodes we were getting like half a second times for queries so clearly you can do a lot better than that and in uh in the you know in, in the zeppelin fleet paper we also were not yet really tackling this uh oh, i missed this slide i wanted uh we were all we were still not really tackling the query thing but we kind of there's but there's a, a trick that you can do to make it a little bit better which is once you've computed your first query and that costs you some amount of time to do uh you can keep that answer around and uh you know like you, the the query algorithm leaves you with a spanning forest and then so as more insertions and deletions come in as long as they don't just get rid of something important in your spanning forest you can reuse that to do more queries I see, I see. and so that allows you to for a little while after you answer a query to do subsequent queries very fast I see, I see. and so if you're in a setting where you have bursty queries that can help a lot but that's a heuristic thing yeah. and so uh really like the one of these things that's in our sites is an algorithmic redesign that doesn't give up any of the nice things i've been describing so far but really makes the queries better so, um, yeah, uh, another question is like, so, so, so uh, if you ha want, want to have a uh, good curve time, so it's also really like oh, which kind of like L0 sampler you, you implement, right? So, yeah, so for, for example, in, in theory, if you do not, um, if, if you do not care about the running time, so the easiest things like you just like do this kind of like multiple level of sampling, you, 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 you use different this kind of sampling probability, and then for each level, just run this kind of like the for example, uh, L2 have a heater or a uh, con sketch for, for, for each level, right? So, but like for your efficiency pur purpose, I guess uh, you cannot just use the this kind of like naive this con sketch. So what kind of L0 sampler are you using for this? Yeah, so uh, so cube sketch, the, like the, the actual thing that cube sketch points to is our L0 sampling thing. I can say a little bit about that. Uh, so I've got some slides for that in here somewhere, I think. Uh, all right, that's, we're not complaining about the model today. Uh, right, so um, this is the way our L0 sketcher works. We've got there our matrix matrix of buckets, right? Like, and so yep. each column is like a vertical slice with like the, the nested subsamples, right? Yep. And so, um, okay, what we do in this version, this is not the most updated version, right? Like, uh, let me show you the part that actually answers your question. So the, Classical L0 sampling has to deal with arbitrary integers. And so they have to do this, you know, like each bucket is keeping like this polynomial thing for the error checking, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. This. yeah. And so because we're doing this only over the field F2, we can do something much simpler. And so in this case, what we're doing is we're keeping track of a running XOR of all of the indices of the positions that are in this random subsample. Then we're also keeping a running XOR of all of the hatches of those. Right, so this is this is much this is much faster to do 
than all the modular exponentiation stuff. I see. And so there's some further tricks that we can do. This is the thing that allows us to shave off the log factor that I mentioned, where we actually, when an update comes in, rather than, okay, so in this little picture here, an update, you pick a bucket, like, you know, like you have a sort of geometric distribution about how far down you go, and then you put it in all the buckets above that. So it actually turns out that once you make this optimization I just described for cube sketch, now you only need to put things in the deepest bucket. And then by doing that, you save a log factor off the worst case time. And now it improves your sampling probability because there are fewer overlaps. I see. Did this answer your question? Uh, yeah, I, I just want to know, like, what was the trick in this kind of L0 sampler? Because, yeah. like, for the most theoretical step, yeah. I'm sure it's, it's not that practical. So yeah. I want to know, yeah. like, how do you implement this Got kind it. of Yeah, so this is this is uh, some of the tricks, some of the tricks that matter the most. I see. Yeah. I see. Yeah. yeah. Good question. Yeah, yeah, because I, I, I think the like a uh, uh, very heavy thing here is so like the how, how to implement this kind of L0 sampler because this is the core of the sketch. Actually, it's just like a bunch of the L0 samplers. So you should have a way like to optimize this kind of L0 yeah. Sam yeah. sampler to make it faster. Right, so yeah, that was a key thing we had to do. And then the other key part is once you go out of core, you need to now ask questions about how you apply updates to the right sketches without yes, having cache yeah, misses, yeah, yeah. and then how do you do your queries without having a yeah, ton of yeah. cache misses. Also, I think this there should be a trade-off between your updates and your query, right? Or, or not? Um, I don't know if there's a crisp theorem that's known about that, but it certainly seems to be the case, right? Like certainly when they get that log over log log query time, that requires an extra two log factors in the, in the or three log factors once we do our optimizations in the update time in the worst case. So yeah, like so far it does seem like there's a trade-off. I don't know how to prove what the the optimal envelope is. That would be an interesting question. Okay. I mean, uh, the, the only thing I will say is that the only lower bounds I know for that are the lower bounds that exist simply for dynamic connectivity where you don't care about small space. So there's that cell probe lower bound, right, where there's like yeah, something I mean, about queries and updates. But I think, I suspect that that if there that there if if there's something to prove here, it's a worse trade off than that. Yeah, I, I think for that lower bound, it's, it's only for space. So uh, so for 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 this kind of streaming, this kind of turnstile, this kind of streaming connectivity, the, there's a the, you mentioned that this unlock cube is is for space. Oh yeah, but no, this is a different lower bound I'm talking about. There's a lower bound in just dynamic connectivity where you don't worry about small space. And oh, then th exactly. there's a lower bound about in the cell probe model see, about exactly. the trade-off between I update see. time and query time. I see. Okay. 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 And I for, it's a little it's it's a little touchy. I don't remember exactly how to state it, but it's like one of them has to be oh, yeah, log yeah. something. I, I don't know. I, we can look it up. But like, there's a different lower bound there, which is the only thing I can think of that would apply here. But I don't think it's tight for the for the streaming case I where see. we have small space. Yeah. 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 Okay. Big question. Yeah. Let's send the speaker. Thanks, everybody.